the dorsal apparatus an absolutely exquisite example of human anatomy although when one looks at it in reality it looks fairly simple as if it's one sheet of tendinous material it is indeed in fact a one of the most complex structures in the human body one of the reasons I believe that we are usually not taught this material in any great detail is because the anatomy is normally highly variable. That means that if we teach all the parts and pieces and details in one specific way, that may not be the reality for the patient who is in front of you. But what I want you to be able to do after this presentation is to back away a little bit and to think of all the parts and pieces but most of all think how they work together to accomplish motion because regardless of the specific anatomy the end function is very much the same now during this presentation I will purposely repeat myself I do that for two reasons one it's easier for us to remember highly complex material if indeed um, that information is repeated and I endeavor to phrase the information differently so that if the first time it was not totally clear perhaps the second repetition will clarify for you. Let's take an in-depth look at the anatomy of the dorsal apparatus. The following video courses that are related to this We'll talk in more depth about um, what muscle does what and we'll actually look at the role of the interosseous and lumbrical muscles specifically. So the purpose of this video course is to be sure that you understand all the parts and pieces of the dorsal apparatus. I have a question. Did you thoroughly gain, did you gain a thorough understanding of the dorsal apparatus during your education and or training. The reason I ask this of you is that when we presented this material in a webinar format, it was very ironic that a hundred percent of the live participants said no, they had not gained a thorough understanding of the dorsal apparatus. I think because it is so complex, it is often taught with just a general overview and yet when we as clinicians focus full time uh, on taking care of hand patients that's really not enough information for us to approach this with any level of sophistication. Here is the dorsal apparatus and its attached muscles and tendons. This specimen has been placed on a piece of plexiglass with light behind it so that we can see the fibers and the interconnections. Let's just take a look at what we're looking at here. Here is the extensor digitorum communis, a very broad flat tendon as it is moving distally and approaching the metacarpal phalangeal joint which we can see here. We can see the thickened area that would be part of the metacarpal phalangeal joint capsule. The extensor digitorum communis continues but it does not continue as this well-defined central cord-like structure. Rather, it splays out to become part of the entire dorsal apparatus. We see two muscles of interosseous bellies here and their contributions, their insertions into the dorsal apparatus, and one muscle here as it has a broad insertion and contribution to the dorsal apparatus. Unusually, or I should say nearly always, the radial aspect, the lumbrical muscle arises from the profundus and inserts into the radial lateral band. Here we see the thickened area over the proximal interphalangeal or PIP joint and you can appreciate that the lateral bands circumvent that joint to some extent. They then come back together, joining together to insert at the terminal tendon insertion. 
many fibers and structures within this one anatomical unit and it may not be totally opposite excuse me it may not be totally obvious what is working when so we hope to tease out that information as we move along here is a close-up view of the proximal aspect of the dorsal apparatus this would be the metacarpal phalangeal joint region and this would be the PIP joint region. These dotted lines represent the fiber, the angle of the fibers themselves. Here we see represented oblique fibers with the purple and the red illustrates the longitudinal fibers that are more parallel with the longitudinal axis of the finger and the blue represents the more proximal transverse fibers. You can see from this illustration that these fibers are overlapping and are running at different angles. Because of their overlap they move relative to one another and it's this layer of fibers that allows the differential movement of the fiber layer thus accommodating to the shape over the dorsum of the interphalangeal joints during finger flexion. These fibers themselves are not elastic. They're very tenacious, very similar to um, our tendinous fibers where the tendon inserts in directly into the bone from a muscle. But the analogy I like to draw is that of a lady's nylon stocking. Even though the fiber, nylon, is not elastic, that fiber is knit into the shape of a stocking. It's the shape of the knit, it's the relationship of the loops that then allows this non-elastic nylon fiber to be rather stretchy. So a very small looking lady stocking can be placed on a leg that is relatively much larger but it's the the relationship of the fibers and not the fibers themselves. That's exactly the case in the dorsal apparatus. The fibers don't stretch to allow the finger to flex. Rather they move. They move laterally and they move distally and they move relative to one another. Here in this schematic drawing we see that in extension the fibers are somewhat more parallel to one another. But then as the finger flexes, one fiber may stay relatively longitudinal while the other has a greater angle of flexion. This fiber movement is the magic of the dorsal apparatus. No wonder a minor injury to the finger can wreak havoc with the balance of motion because now one fiber layer becomes adherent to the other. They can no longer move uh, independently of one another. The fibers in the dorsal apparatus, when the finger is flexed, have tension in the middle portion. Think about it. If a tendon is going over the top of a joint and the joint is flexed, the tendon has a longer distance over which it must traverse versus the lateral fibers in this case the lateral bands, are not as tense during flexion. So in the flex position it's the central fibers that are tense and in the extended position it's the lateral fibers. Now we will look at this in a bit more detail and I think as we go through these video courses it, this concept will become clearer to you. It might help to keep in mind the analogy of a lady's nylon stocking. The nylon itself is a fiber that is not stretchy and yet once you knit the nylon fiber into a stocking form it's very stretchy. You can take a small stocking and put it on a much larger leg. Just as with the nylon stocking the fibers in the dorsal apparatus are not elastic but they move in relationship to one another just like the loops of the knit nylon and that's what allows this movement to take place 
and it appears as if this dorsal apparatus is stretching and moving with the joint movement when in fact it is the differential layers that are moving. The dorsal apparatus, as we've talked about, is called the dorsal apparatus by some, but it has many other names. We're looking at just the left ring finger in these drawings, and throughout these video courses, these drawings will always be the left ring finger. We could call it many different things, using either the word dorsal or the word extensor to describe the anatomy. Now, I choose to use the term dorsal apparatus, but any of the terms that use dorsal, in my opinion, would be more correct than extensor. Well, why is that? Well, Smith in 1974 clarified for us that indeed, even though this is on the extensor surface, the dorsal apparatus is responsible for flexion of the metacarpal phalangeal joint. He therefore suggested that it's somewhat contradictory to call this an extensor anything because it also is responsible for flexion. So I agree with Smith that the dorsal apparatus would be more appropriate. You can certainly correctly call it dorsal aponeurosis, hood, expansion, all of those are correct, but we choose during these presentations to use the term dorsal apparatus.